Hello, inspired friends. Welcome to Inspired Parenting, parenting from an attachment trauma perspective with Daphna Lender. This is a free eight part monthly series. And whether you're a parent or you interact with children in other capacities, I'm sure you'll find this information encouraging and useful. And I also suspect you'll find Daphna's hands-on tools, a great resource that you can apply right away. And it's not just for children. Daphna always says this work applies to people 18 months to 100 years old. My name is Mary Frangi, and I'm a program specialist at the Trauma Research Foundation. We hope this workshop helps you pause, ground yourself, and focus on taking constructive action. And if you're watching us on YouTube, please consider subscribing. It tells YouTube that you find this content valuable, and as a result, they'll show it to more people. So it's my great pleasure now to introduce to you our presenter. Daphna Lender is a child and family therapist with over 25 years of experience. She's a certified trainer, supervisor, and consultant in TheraPlay and Dyadic Developmental Psychotherapy and co-author of the book TheraPlay, The Practitioner's Guide. Daphna has successfully treated children and their parents from various backgrounds, including children raised in orphanages, those with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, those exposed to domestic violence and community violence, and children of parents with chronic mental illness and attachment wounds. Daphna provides training and consultations for psychologists and psychotherapists around the world. We're so happy to have you, Daphna. Take it away. Thanks, Mary. Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here because play is my favorite subject. Um, And I hope this hour infuses you with the inspiration to go for it and to try to find ways to be more playful, more lighthearted, just to have a playful spirit, if not necessarily even um, initiating actual activities that you're going to see, which I'm going to show you on video, but it's more of a playful spirit that would be great um, if people can be inspired. And I first want to tell you that we all need to play. Uh, Adults still need to play. We were Everybody was a child once and you had your own way of playing. So I first encourage you to take a moment and to think of what was a time that you remember as a child, if you can remember maybe before the age of 12 and even maybe before the age of 10 or eight, what did you love to do? Did you love to play outside and go on maybe adventures if you lived in like the woods or even in the city, you would maybe go in the alley and play by with your friends, or did you love to collect items and have um, things that you were always rearranging, you know, or building? Yeah. And, or maybe you love to dance and to move and be a, uh, a, um, an actor, there there are lots of different ways of playing. And that is probably your way of playing. Probably, maybe you love to make art and that's probably very inherent to your personality. And then think also at what point were you ever discouraged from playing? Maybe you played too loudly and somebody punished you or yelled at you or you got in trouble or they said that it was too frivolous and it was discouraged after a certain age. Or maybe the type of play that you played was shed in a negative light, like you like playing with dolls and you were um, a male and you weren't encouraged to play with dolls. uh, Everybody has a play history and that will affect the way you play with your kids today, both for positive and for negative. You might unintentionally transmit uh, messages that you uh, got that were negative and you know, that's the negative um, outcome, but the positive outcome is that you can think about what you like to play and see if you can understand what your child likes to play and um, see where that matches. So it's kind of interesting to think about your play history. And um, I want to say that play is the opposite of depression because depression is where you have no motivation and no focus, and you don't feel that sense of aliveness. And in order to be really Playful, you have to be in the moment and be focused. And there is not that concern about like what people think of you or the hypervigilance of what's going on 
or what will happen. It's really being in the flow. So play is a great antidote to some of the depression and anxiety that a lot of people are feeling. Uh, and life is so serious for us as adults. We have a lot of responsibility as parents and also perhaps our children are um, causing us a lot of trouble and, and there's a lot of conflict. So it really reduces our motivation or our ability to be playful. But I'm, what I want to suggest is that you can hopefully initiate play in small ways and it's going to make a big difference um, for your relationship with your child. The uh, idea is if you have a lot of stress in your relationship with a person, but you also have a lot of playfulness and laughter, that really helps the relationship and it offsets the conflict and the trauma. So you can have a strong bond despite the fact that you have a lot of conflict, which I think is really interesting. It's like almost an, an antidote to conflict. And sometimes parents say that like by playing, it feels like they're minimizing what the child did that was wrong or that they're really were, you know, maybe they misbehaved. And um, that isn't, it, that's not, there isn't, I'd like to break that link of thinking, okay, my, my child was misbehaving and he was being really rowdy or really rough or he wasn't listening to me. And now I don't feel like, rewarding him with being playful. But actually when you are connected through play, the person, the child has more motivation to be uh, compliant or cooperative and, or to make compromises because it really helps their self-esteem and their sense of connection. So in coronavirus times, the, um, you know, we had to move therapy from in person to online. And uh, so I have some videos that I want to show you of a family who generously uh, allowed me to share some of their play activities just to inspire you the, um, the types of activities that you can play. So let me go ahead and share my screen. So these slides are taken from the, um, the ideas are taken from the TheraPlay method, which is a, um, it's a play therapy method and just kind of a philosophy as well of playful parenting. And the activities in TheraPlay are organized around the four dimensions of TheraPlay. And the first dimension is structure. So when you play, if you can be the leader and organize the activities in such a way that they're organized and they're safe so that people, the children aren't let's say you're playing balloon and one child is going berserk and jumping with the balloon all over the place and trying to jump on the balloon and pop it or pop it in people's faces. Uh, that is not safe for the other people. So we will find a way, I suggest to find a way of making it organized by like saying, let's see if we can count and see if we as a team can get it, the balloon to stay up in the air until the count of 10, something like that. So the, um, activities that we're going to play are structured as opposed to being really wild. And this is not for, this is not necessarily in every game and because sometimes free play and imaginative play doesn't need any structure, but just keep in mind that sometimes you need to be the leader of the, um, of, and, and set the, um, the rhythm of it and the organization of an activity. Um, it helps the child to feel trusting and that they don't have to manage on their own. Let me show you an activity now that demonstrates that. So this is called Balloon Between Two Bodies. Let's um, check with that. Uh, here's our, our um, esteemed uh, family that's willing to show their video. <laughs> Three, four, five, six, seven. Wow. <laughs> nice job, Noam. Okay. Now here's a here's a funny game to play with a balloon. You stand side to side so you guys are almost shoulder to shoulder and put the balloon between your shoulders. Put the balloon right between your shoulders. Yes. Oh, thank you, sweetie. You're okay. Now see if you can keep the balloon between your shoulders and walk across the room without dropping it. So walk well, like any, any way you can. That way? Okay. It wasn't that big. Yes. So. 
I'm sorry. Get, it. Get the balloon so where you like it. There you go. And start walking. <gasps> Look at that. Quite a lot of coordination between you two. Your face. <laughs> keep going. Keep, okay, now you're going the other way. Okay, okay. Good. Okay, now pause. Now take the balloon and put it between your back so you're back to back. Okay, now decide if you want, you can hold hands so that you can know which way you're going. And you can decide which, who's leading, and you can walk a certain way walk forwards, walk backwards. I walk towards first. Okay. <laughs> Very nice, you. Two. Do you want to wear it or you want me to leave? You go. Okay. I have an idea. Wow. Ah, ah. Whoa! It's working. You're going around and around. That's oh, so that. good. Okay. It's it's working. Wow. No, you're doing an especially good job. Okay, now I'll take the balloon and put it forehead to forehead. What? It's stuck to Heather's head. Forehead to forehead? Oh, good idea. Okay. You guys are so coordinated together. Okay, let's go down. Oh! Whoa! Oh. Are you going to go back up too? Yeah, we did it. Oh, I love it. <laughs> okay. Good job. Okay, so can you imagine taking a balloon and, say, and just playing with it in your home and saying, hey, let me see something. I want to see if we can walk across the um, living room while holding this balloon between our shoulders or between our, between our backs and your kid might say, that's so weird. And you say, yeah, I know, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a very weird person. So, you know, don't, you don't have to take any of their blusters um, to heart. Um, you just have to keep a lighthearted attitude and try it out. And if they reject it, that's okay. You could try again, um, but the, it's more just the playful spirit. And I think the structured part of this is that I was saying, you know, put it between your back, put it between your shoulder and walk around. So it's clear what the directions are. And it kind of takes the um, pressure off the child to like have to suggest a lot of different variations. And sometimes when kids are suggesting a lot of different variations, they kind of get too escalated. So this keeps it regulated and clearly there was, there was a lot of cooperation and that feels really good, especially with a, a, a child and parent who have conflict a lot or sadness and things. It's just nice to have those moments where you're really connected and cooperative. The next dimension is engagement, which is just that sense of being connected together. You just feel like you're not alone. You feel uh, that sense of, my parent really sees me and hears me and understands me and that it's fun to have to be in relationship. So all these activities have element of engagement, but many activities that are engaging are the ones that have elements of silliness or surprise, something unexpected or, you know, or big dramatic things happen. Let me show you an activity that's called slippery slip that has a strong element of engagement. That the game that you love. Okay. So you are going to be, um, you have to be sitting like against the wall, but also make sure you have something behind you that um, is soft enough. So maybe you could put a pillow or maybe you could use those, yeah, those yoga mats as long as they're soft. And then um, Ema's going to sit in front of you. And if you sit in front of him, then you can do the lotion, like the slippery slip. Do you remember the game where you hold on to his arms and then you fall backwards? You go this way. Oh. So fold your legs, um, Noam, so you can hear, so that Ema can get close to you. And then Ema, you're gonna put um, lotion on both of Noam's arms so that they're slippery. <laughs> ah, there you go. You know what you're doing. <laughs> ah, it's funny. That feels so good when somebody stretches you out like that. All right, slippery now. Okay, and then you're going to hold on but, uh, like at his elbows or even above, and you're going to try to hold on, and you're going to slip back. You're going to go, oh, 
Hold on, I've tried, hold on, and then you fall backwards. Oops. You fall, uh, go, can you go, oh, where he goes, so try and hold on, and I'm slipping away. He's trying to hold on, and I slipped. Can you try to go like even slower, so like if you're like making it more dramatic? I'm trying to hold on, I can't hold on, I'm trying, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so the giggles um, and the unexpected, you know, of when is she going to fall off, right? Um, the eye contact and the touch and things like that. And I'm clearly that's very engaging for them. And I'm trying to be very encouraging and, and play along, even though I'm not in the room. I'm trying to simultaneously amplify the excitement. Okay, next is the next dimension is the nurture, which is activities that are calming and soothing. And there's a sense of just like filling the child up with love. It's oftentimes associated with like when you feed and rock and stroke a baby and cuddle them. But for an older child, how do you do that? So there are many ways that you can make the child feel connected to you by some sort of, usually it's like a, maybe a story or touch in a, um, in a comfortable way that's soothing. And so here's an example that you can be inspired by, and it's called the weather report, which is basically like a massage, but you you, you tell the story of the weather. There's some directions here. And by the way, these slides are in, the TRF website's link to the video. And I'll ask Mary to put the link also in the chat so that you don't feel that you, uh, you know, need to take notes on this. It's, it's, it's available to you. So the directions um, are available. And, but you should, it's more, you can see how it looks when you're um, watching the video. Okay, so here we go. Okay. So I'm going to pretend that I have my own, it's going to be my, oh, that's a good idea. So that way um, I can see your back. I'm going to pretend that this, this is my person who I'm going to do my, my um, <laughs> weather report. You should do it on a dog. <laughs> on a dog, yeah, if he would cooperate, but he's going to be naughty. Okay, so I'm going to use both hands and I'm going to go like this. I know I can't use both hands, but I'm pretending I am. Today in Chicago was a wind, a windy day, so go back and forth. Heather's just gonna go back and forth. Yeah, very nice. A windy, windy, windy day. And there were big clouds that were in the sky. That's right. Big, heavy, puffy clouds. And they were very, very heavy because inside they had sheets of rain that went down and down and down. And they kept going down to the ground. And on the ground there was little buds of flowers and little leaves of grass that were getting the water. And the water was seeping into the. I'm moving it forward, but I want you to see how long it takes. It really does take a while for the whole process to sort of roll out in terms of the storytelling, and the child relaxes more. Little flowers and little leaves, because of the rays of sun, that sun they're going to go down to the ground. The rays, they're going to warm up the earth and make little buds come out and peek out over the earth. The waves of Lake Michigan, like little rays of light. And that is the weather for Chicago. That was a good weather. Good at that. I really like his smile at the end, this sort of uh, just like, uh, you know, uh, because 
when you tell the story when a good rhythm and there's nice firm touch, it's not supposed to be ticklish. It's supposed to be relaxing and you have to do it for a little while. That took like three and a half minutes. And then, you know, you can see how uh, happy and relaxed he is. So kids like this and even maybe even kids who don't like touch necessarily generally or massage because it's in the story they like it more because they feel less reactive to the touch when it's part of the story and part of an activity. And I recommend that you don't uh, tickle or you don't keep saying, what do you think the weather's next? What do you think the weather's next? Because it's supposed to be you doing it for the child. And when you ask them questions, then they have to have their, their thinking brain on and they're not able to relax when you're constantly being asked questions and to contribute uh, ideas. So let's go on to the very last dimension of the four, which is challenge. And challenge is the dimension of giving the kid opportunities to feel successful by setting up activities that they can feel proud that they're accomplished. So they're not, they're not meant to be hard activities or competitive. They're supposed to just be like, wow you can jump really high or wow, you're so strong. That kind of sense of, um, I, I liken it to if you had, if you have seen like a toddler child who's three and they love to jump off the couch or three or four, and they want to pretend that they're flying. And then each time they do it, they want you to clap for them be like, you're a superman. They want you to do that over and over again. And that gives them a lot of self-esteem, which goes a long way towards them becoming more resilient and then when they have to wait their turn or lose at a game in kindergarten or first grade they're able to sustain that that frustration or that disappointment because they got a lot of the admiration when they were younger so it's really important especially for kids who are sore losers or don't do well when they uh, lose so the emphasis is, is is just really on celebrating them and more cooperation than than con, um, competition. But if it is a competition, you don't you let essentially let the child win two out of three rounds of what you're playing and ba- make it. Um, it's just for fun. So you're not focused on um, who's winning. Okay, let me watch. Let me have you watch. These are now we. What I did was put the two children, the siblings. Um, facing the mom and I had given her a clue, uh, you know, a heads up that I want her to let the children win two out of three rounds. This is called cotton ball war. You ready? Yeah. Yeah. On your marks. Get set. Go. I said, give them, a, give, make yourselves a, high, a, a special high five handshake for the winners. And so, yeah, this is just an activity for, just for fun. And the challenge obviously is easy enough for them to do it. And the mom is being really cooperative with letting them win so that they can feel triumphant. Yeah. So those are some ideas. And, you know, if you're in the car or something, you're not going to be able to play these activities like uh, and in this organized way that you're needing to set it up with props, but you can still be playful. You can play a game that is called peanut butter and jelly, where if you say a word like peanut butter in a funny way, and then the child has to say jelly the same way you say peanut butter. So if you say peanut butter, the child would need to copy it and say jelly. And then um, you'd say 
peanut butter. And then the child copies. Jelly. Then you can switch roles. You can switch words and change the words to some other thing like um, hot dog and hamburger or something like that. Okay, so it's more of a spirit of playfulness. And this mom that I just showed you, she has this funny habit of taking the um, sticker off a banana or an apple and putting it on her like forehead and just pretending she didn't notice and be like, what, what? And, you know, it, people, the kids, you know, preteens and teens will say you're weird, but they're going to remember that as a spirit of, of joyfulness and lightheartedness. And they really need that. So right now I'm going to switch over and to ask the participants in the audience, if you would like to ask me questions and scenarios, I bet you probably are having thoughts come into your mind. Like how would I do it with my kid who has this particular challenge? And I'll happily take your questions and converse with you. So while we're waiting for our first volunteer, there was a question that came in through the chat that asked, um, are there ways to adapt this for children who resist close contact at first or who have sensory sensitivity? Uh, for the balloon game, you don't have to hold hands. Um, you can just put, and you can just bob the balloon back and forth if they don't want to be close to you, even if that's a um, issue for them, as far as like even just having the balloon between your shoulders. For the engagement activity of slippery slip, um, you can probably hold their, see if you could hold their feet and have them push you over on the count of three feet with socks is a little bit more farther away from than um, holding their, their hands and their arms and maybe not use lotion. So just like count to hold their feet with socks or shoes on and then say on the count of three, one, two, three, and then they push you over or they can blow you over. So it's like on the count of three, see if I can blow you over with, by, going and blow them over and they vice versa. Um, for nurture, you can do it on a, a teddy bear, both you and the child do it on a teddy bear or a pillow. And the prosodic voice, which is that storytelling voice with the rhythm is very soothing and it really kind of simulates. So it simulates touch. So you don't have to have the child, uh, put it on, you know, do it on the child's back. They can just follow along on a pillow and do it as well. So, and the challenge one was basically didn't involve touch. So, all right. Thank you. Hello. Good day, Elizabeth. Hi, how are you? Good. Good. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for hosting this for free. It's uh, really valuable. I appreciate it. Good. Um, so, I, I love everything that you're saying. I, uh, it totally makes sense with the connection with children and how they need, they really need, I'm a middle school teacher and, and have kids of my own. And I know that they desperately need that uh, just lightheartedness right now and, and all of that. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you have, I'm going through a divorce personally and I'm wondering if you have a play that's um, helpful, especially for children who are going through um, divorce or if just any, any of the, the play resources that you have could be useful. Thanks. Oh, okay. Well, that's a, that's a topic that's close to my heart. Um, how old is the child now that you're talking about? They're 10 and 12. Okay. 10 and 12. I, off the top of my head, I can't necessarily think of activities that are specific to, um, divorce, but more so the idea that there's a sense of loss and the sense of feeling that like you could have done something or that it was your fault. And there's a sense of also feeling disorientation a lot, like a lot of confusion. And so grounding activities and soothing activities like the weather report uh, or doing things like just nurturing things for the children as much as possible um, 10 and 12, you think, okay, well, these people are independent now and stuff like that. But actually, if you can do like, you know, hand massage or do nail polish, if they like that, or um, really like bring them, you know, bring them a drink, 
things that they could do for themselves, like and stroke their hair or sit next to them on the couch with like your full, I don't know if they like to cuddle, but your arm, like your full arm contact with their arm and like, or make um, little nests with pillows and blankets and things. It's that grounding thing, especially with the transition when they come home, if they're doing moving back and forth from, from homes, it's really like unsettling. What is that? How does that strike to you? Yeah. I mean, that sounds um, right on. They need, they need that settling. Um, I like the nesting kind of idea too. And yeah, we do like night massage, you know, before bed and things like that, but I could, Mm -hmm. um, and we do a lot of play. It was just silly. We're just kind of silly. I could bet. Oh, but they're, they're also really scheduled. You know what I mean? Like kids, especially today, I feel like are really scheduled as well. So um, it's that balance of finding time for spontaneous play or even like in my mind, kind of scheduling it in, it in you know, <laughs> even well, if I don't tell them like, this is our play time. You, know? you should, you totally should. You should play yeah. that, schedule that in. Yeah. That'll, mm-hmm. it'll, that'll work. Like, um, maybe, you know, after school for 15 minutes or before bed or on a weekend or something like that. But one of the things that is going to, that I hear you saying, which I think is really a a silver, I mean, not a silver line, but like a real strength is parent children are worried about their parents. And so if they see you being playful, it gives them hope. Like, Oh, my mom isn't destroyed by this, or she's not like hopeless or you know, there's so many strains, there's the relational loss, there's the financial stress, there's the blah, blah, all the things. And so they're worried about their parent. And so mm-hmm. seeing the parent's vitality really helps. In, Great. In well, thank you so much. Yeah. Hello. I don't Hi. know. Is it? Hi, I'm not sure if it's my turn. Okay. <clears throat> so I have a three-year-old. Um, he loves dinosaurs. Jurassic Park is his thing. Um, so he's always like reenacting like p- parts of the movie that he gets to see on YouTube. Um, so it's always like dinosaurs biting on other dinosaurs. Um, and then he'll switch it up to like dinosaurs being best friends. Uh, so that's, that's one of the, I guess, I guess my question is how can I use the fact that he loves dinosaurs and maybe help him with eating habits? Like he's, he's, he's such a picky eater and, um, it's just so tough to get him to eat things that he used to eat when he was a baby, when, before he turned two. Um, so, so how can I use play to just encourage him to be open to trying new foods um, or just better his eating habits? Hmm. Oh, that's a challenging one for me uh, to answer, um, Maita. Like, I would really need to know a lot more about his eating challenges. And so my, 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 my first, you know, instinct is to say that when a child has eating issues and there's a lot of power struggles that could happen around it, people, parents get super stressed. It's one of the most elemental things that is, yeah, that is a parent's job. And, you know, you're concerned about his nutrition and like what trajectory is going to and why he lost interest in foods that he had previously been eating. Yeah. So the maybe two pieces of advice that is, that I could possibly give is if there's any way that you could, he's three. So he's, I don't know if he's like big in his big physically or not. Like, can you still pick him up? Um, But do activities. I know he really likes the Jurassic park and dinosaurs and he likes to play with the figurines, but if you can do anything physical with him, like pick him up and um, give him piggyback rides or like um, swing him around and like do like games where he's, you, you know, you're going like this and he's like upside down and then you pick him up like things that you would do with a little bit younger babies, children and things that just have this sense where you're physically together. Um, it may just get him out of his sort of like 
focus on the dinosaur and the replaying the same scenes. Um, and I just want him to kind of have more connection with you maybe in the play. And I'm not saying that's going to help with the food, but sometimes when a child feels a little bit more relaxed and cooperative, they might be more open to like trying things. The other thing is, is um, I would do, you know, I would get an assessment. Maybe you've already gotten an assessment from like a developmental specialist or um, just somebody who deals with, um, you know, eating issues or feeding issues. Um, I don't know if you've, if you've done that, but there might be like sensory things that he's sensitive to and techniques. Just the other thing though, is until you get some car, some sort of help, I actually would like really not pressure, put pressure around the food, just put out, put out some things for him to eat and let him explore them without being focused on him eating those things that you want him to, because there's nothing like food to make a control battle for some, for a child who's going to, you know, dig in their heels and get over-focused on, on one thing versus another. And so, yeah, I would just try to see if you can back off of the um, responsibility of getting his food, you know, to be more diverse. That's really stressful on the relationship and the relationship comes first. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And in and, and having more of that physical connection with him, I have seen that he does become more calm. And like he's like, yes, mama, like two things that I'm like oh. asking him to do. So it, it, that makes sense to me. And definitely oh. the options of like food out there. And yeah, that, that I can see that working. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Hi. Is it my turn? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing such valuable information. And um, the part that I'd like to consult with you about my almost a six-year-old son is I really found your approach of giving lots of uh, admiration while playing so that they can build confidence so that they continue maintain good self worth while even though they are not losing even though they're losing while they're playing games in school so my son like a lot of children he's very competitive <laughs> and he has a hard time regulating his uh, emotions and he has a very low tolerance of losing so as you suggested we you know, pretend to lose and uh, try to build his self-esteem. And he absolutely loves that. But somehow, oops, we somehow actually win. Then he gets very upset. And mm -hmm. it takes a while. It, it gets better as uh, he gets older. But he gets a very, very upset. And his um, unpleasant emotions last for quite a while. So I would like to see what would you suggest to regulate his emotions or build more admiration? Mm, it sounds like you're already doing that part. Let me ask you how long, when you say his unpleasant emotions, um, what do you, what do you mean specifically? And you said last for quite a while. So what do you, what's, what's the, the quite a while? So he would cry obviously, and, you know, throw a temper tantrum, possibly good. 10, 15 minutes to sometimes 30 minutes. Okay. And he pout. It gets better over time. But sometimes it's right. okay. Sometimes it's not. But um, it it is um, something that I'm afraid of playing games because when somehow I win, which I try to not win, <laughs> um, yeah. he gets very upset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds like there's like now become an aversion to playing or for you to win, which will happen occasionally, despite your best intentions. I understand what you're saying. And um, so when he has the unpleasant um, reactions, I'd like you to switch your sort of lens or perspective and find look at it as an opportunity. When he has a, he loses and really, you know, upset and he's pouting, he's crying. He has a temper tantrum, like whatever uh, that means, then you want to stay empathic and steady. Like don't, 
you know, you, you're, you don't have to convince them and say, Hey, but you did win the other two games and you are really, really still good at this activity. And Hey, here, let's play again. And I'll make sure that you win this time. Like you don't have to convince him. You don't have to say you're really good at this activity. Just be like, I got you. It is, it's, it is really hard. It's frustrating. I know I got you. Yep. Yep. And just let him have the feelings, but don't try to rescue him and let the time pass. You said 10, 15 minutes. Well, after you do this, you you probably see that after a little while, that'll get shorter, the amount of time that it takes for him to recover. But um, what you also don't want to do is just, you know, be, you know, don't show him like, look at your first, I'm really, you know, like you probably don't do this, but to show like frustration and giving up and being like, Ugh. Well, we'll just have to apply again next time because right now you're not being, you know, you're being kind of a sore loser. Um, so try just just stay real steady and not give them negative messages either. So it's like neither trying to cajole him and make him feel better nor, you know, show frustration and give up. Just let him have that experience. He'll if you give him empathy about it, you'll he'll 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 get better over time. Hmm, that's all very interesting because uh, the thing that you assume that I would not do, I am doing it. <laughs> so, oh. so I I get frustrated too. So I was like, oh, you know, it's like a lots of this, this is not a good time to do it. Let's do it later. Or it's like, oh, you did, you know, win this time. So I did all that. Probably that wasn't helpful. So uh, I appreciate that you just, uh, you know, try to, you know, have in the moment validating emphasizing just to simply letting him observe the emotions and then move on and then exactly. have him overcome that type of unpleasant experience. That's really exactly. helpful. I appreciate it. Yeah, that's exactly, you got it. Exactly. Yeah. Cause those pleasant and pleasant experiences are becoming in and of themselves, something scary and aversive and actually it's okay to have them. Absolutely. That's what you're, yeah, that's what you're saying. Yeah. Thank you. That's awesome. Okay, and don't you thank you. Hello. Hello. Um, joining him from Massachusetts. Thank you so much Hi. for <laughs> the webinar. Um, your last um, play activity reminded me of a question. Um, I was wondering if there are other play methods that might sort of allow children to explore like their physicality and aggression and like a uh, sort of a gentle, more positive way, just like, you know, when they were throwing the cotton balls, like it was like a safe contained way for them to sort of, you know, be physical throwing um, and particularly thinking of children who might be a bit younger or might have like impulsivity, hyperactivity that um, might need sort of ways to sort of, explore those things in a safe way okay that's a really good question are you thinking of a child like in in general or are you thinking of a specific child that you know um i'm you know like the closest i'm thinking of are like my two boy toddlers but you know it's like um i'd be interested like generally for you know children up to like age five six um okay and, Got it. Okay, because um, the because uh, because you're right. You know, there's a different. Okay, so kids, kids like three year olds or no matter how old, five, seven, they can be dysregulated, like chaotic, like running around and like hitting things by mistake. You know, because they're energetic and like they're not organized in their body. That's one thing. But another thing is you you mentioned aggression, so. We don't, I don't really want to use activities to like for healthy aggression necessarily because it gets, there's a sense that like, here, you're angry, you want to punch something, okay, punch this pillow. That's not what we would do. But I want to find a way that the children can feel like I can have a strong body and strong experiences with another person and it can be relational and it can be safe. And so from that point of view, yes, we want to do plenty of those activities and they're, they're, they require a lot of structure, which was just the first dimension of therapy that I mentioned. 
And one classic TheraPlay activity is the following. You take a piece of newspaper. So you open up a newspaper that's like the double sheet, you know, the kinds, the old fashioned kind, like the New York Times. And you hold it in front of the child like this so that you're far away in terms of your arms not um, being close to your body. And then you can tell the child, do you see with a strong muscle, the strong fist, I want you to punch the paper in the middle when I count to three. And you tell the child, I'm not going to, don't worry, you're not going to hurt me. I'm not going to hurt you because like there's room here. And then you tell them, okay, get ready with your, with your fist. One, two, three, punch. And then when the kid punches, if you just stretch out the paper a little, it does rip in half. And you say, wow, you're so strong. You've got a really good muscle. So you see that I'm trying to make it like very coordinated and very admiring of his strength, but it isn't like, Oh, you're angry. Okay, here, punch this paper. Got it. And also another activity that comes to mind are activities where, you know, in judo or karate or anything like that, they really um, have these strong, you know, things where you expel your energy, but it's done in such a respectful way, coordinated way. One activity is you take pillows and the more sturdy the pillows are, the more like um, dense they are, the easier it is. I I wish I could show you on my floor right here. Um, You stack up the pillows on the ground and then you have the child stand on the pillows. Then you have the child balance on the pillows like this. And then you take their hands and then you tell them on the counter, they want you to jump as high as you can and then jump off. And so it lets them feel like they're doing something really, you know, kind of wild and challenging, but you're doing it with them and you're holding their hands and then letting them balance and then taking their hands again, and then counting to three and having them jump. And they, they just love it. Yeah. So. That's, that's fantastic. That's exactly. Cause you know, I mean, like particularly I'm thinking of last night when they were sort of giggling and doing this, but like not, structured not and sort of slightly dangerously and I was like how can we channel this in a more contained way that still lets them so that's really fantastic (laughs) yeah good so you're gonna say hey guys I love this activity it's so fun I'm gonna do it in a way where first it's gonna be you know you said you had two toddlers. So like first it's going to be boy a and then or you know (laughs) child a and child b and then we're gonna clap for him great it's your turn. Now it's your turn. Or you do have to sort of, you do have to organize. You have no choice, but to organize it. The people who are um, the best at this are, you know, the kindergarten teachers that you watch. That's kind of, you kind of have to be like a kindergarten teacher. You can't, you wish you could have it be, you know, that your house is like, well, I'm at home. I, I shouldn't have to, you know, run a kindergarten, but actually they do a lot of structuring through singing and rhythm and things like that. And they are the masters. Okay, thanks, SJ. Hello, Jesse. Hi. Um, I actually did not. I thought I was just going to be listening, but now all of these, all of these scenarios are really encouraging me. I have a nine and a half year old and an almost four year old. My nine and a half is like ADHD, very very smart, sort of sensory, but he's like a mommy's boy. Never had tantrums really. My three and a half year old daughter, she was born a little bit premature. Um, my response and my ability to engage with her has always been different because she's not as, you know, triggering to, to like to me. So I've learned through, well, and she just did this now. And this is what I don't understand is that despite a much more regulated approach that we've had with her, given that she's our second, given that, you know, I had gone through a lot of, um, parental like therapy and support for her. I'm surprised that she has so much screaming like fits and so I don't understand it and I'm actually surprised by my response because I never react to it you know with my son I was very anxious and a lot of things were going on so I was always making sure he wasn't upset and just very like constantly responsive I'm constantly responsive with her and I feel like because I'm 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 more experienced her I, I don't feel like I'm as reactive, but I also feel like my response isn't appropriate because she'll scream. And I think, my God, this little tiny girl is Mm -hmm. 
just suddenly, you know, she doesn't get exactly what she wants or something. I'm not going to, and I, I'm not encouraging that. Like I won't just give her what she wants, but suddenly Mm -hmm. she's just screams at the top of her lungs. And I realized that my thing is I, I just go blank because I don't understand it. And then I, A lot of the times I'll validate her feelings. I'm like, oh my goodness, you're really angry or you really wanted that. And I really wish I could give it to you. And I do all the things, but she'll go, I was like, do you want me to, can I help you feel better? You know, can I help you by giving you a hug? But I really don't feel like I have anything else in my toolbox. Like that's really the only thing I do is I just try to help co-regulate. And I don't understand why I don't really have a, a, another response to her. I think I'm more just confused as to why she. Wow. You, your description is fantastic. You know, the confusion of feeling um like you're a little bit distant and removed and you're just like, uh, let me go through my toolbox here, but I don't understand you. It's yeah. like spot on in terms of some parent, you know, our parent, parent, we, we feel that way as parents and it does not a good feeling, right. Cause you're supposed to like know what's going on with your kid and yeah. be connected to yourself. And like, you yeah. know, I totally get you. But let me ask you something. When you, when, when you say, can I, you, you give her empathy or like, Oh, you've really, you, that was really frustrating or, you know, and then you say, um, can I, can I help you? Can I give you a hug and make you feel better? And she goes, <laughs> you know, she's, do she let you hug? her and does it doesn't make her feel better so so you've captured so the first part that you captured is my husband and our response to her is we kind of look at her and we're both a little bit and even me like I, I don't know if that's giving too much power so I try to immediately offer the validation and then I say can I make you feel like how can I help you feel better Mm-hmm. And now she asks for the hug because she knows usually that one of the only things that I can do to help her co-regulate, uh, because I'm not going to just give her what she wants in that very moment, sure. is to hug her. So, But now sometimes she'll scream so much and then I'm busy doing something and she'll open her arms and be like, mom, where's the hug? So oh. have I taught her? Like, I'm so confused. Like, have I now taught her that this is how she asks for hugs? But but that's not the only time we we do right. all sorts of sort of rough and tumble play we oh, read every night, lots of hugs and cuddles and kisses. So I'm like, is this just her temperament? Like this scream, has she learned? Sorry, I, I, I don't want to. I'm also, I'm a, I'm a therapist. I'm just not a child therapist. <laughs> and I don't know how my brain just stops and be like, what, what am I supposed to do in this situation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, you're not taking up too much time because it feels like, you know, each scenario has content. Like we have to understand. So, okay. Um, I know that you're initially like startled and you look at her or whatever. And um, so if there's any way you might be able to like din- diminish the, the yeah. amount of time that you give her that look, like, <laughs> yeah. except, yeah, okay, it is her personality right now as a three and a half year old. There's nothing wrong with it. And the fact that she is going to come to you for hugs and she learned that, that's fantastic. Okay, so you don't have to feel super connected to her or a super understanding like what it is that's motivating her because what you're doing is working and you're not spoiling her. And this isn't the only time she gets hugged and you do a lot of other rough and tumble things. So it's, it's really fine. Just flow with it. Like you're doing really well, I think. And she doesn't do it anywhere else. So she doesn't okay. do it at daycare. Makes and sense. she has not done it like in public. It's really, and even if we're out in the grocery store, it's oh, wow. just Lucky at home, you. but I'm, I'll mm-hmm. be, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to jinx anything. Okay. So <laughs> I'll be mindful of the initial response because really that I I think that somehow that is still something that might be a little bit it's it's too much power for her tiny little body to be like wow I have capacity to completely freeze these two grown human beings by screaming like this I wonder right there's something frightening to you about her as if like there's something wrong but I would trust that there isn't and um and move forward from there thanks so much you're welcome yeah sure Jesse Okay, I think we're going to take one last one from Aline. Hi. Hi. This is very helpful. Um, I think I am a little bit lost. My daughter is seven. And we've always done the connect before you correct. Um, We're very connected. I always validate her feelings. 
but I don't know if it's about turning seven or what else could be in her needs that when she gets frustrated and she doesn't get what she wants or she's doing a drawing and something doesn't come out right or a friend, you know, is hurts her like with words and she's just like, I hate you. I hate my life. And, and we've been having people, but we've always had people over and I'm very uncomfortable that she starts saying, I hate you. I want you to leave. And I've, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, I don't know how to get her out of that. I've taken her upstairs just to, you know, let's calm our bodies so we can get back down. And she gets angry. She started kicking me and she's never being physical. I don't know how else to stop her. I don't know if I should leave her by herself to calm herself down or um, like I ask her to breathe, but it's almost like she, let's say she's mad at the drawing and then she takes it on the person. Like, I hate you. I want you out of my house. It's mm-hmm. screaming. And it's just being rude to other people and not honoring mm-hmm. exactly what is it that you need. You know, I'm like, what do you need? Let's go back to that. Okay. Yeah. When she gets frustrated with something, I, I, it's like a rabbit hole and I am too less right now, I think, especially in, when we're with a bunch of other people and it becomes very uncomfortable yeah. hurting other people's kids, you know? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, it does sound like she has, look, she has regulation issues and not unlike the person who I talked to before um, you, you begin to be afraid of the negative feelings and affect um, and it becomes like a cycle. Uh, and so you try and, you know, tiptoe around the kid, um, and give them a lot of power. So if she, first of all, okay. If she says, I hate you, I hate this, blah, blah. This is a, this is her way of expressing how uncomfortable she is. And in a very, it's a very extreme way of saying, I am so freaked out and so uncomfortable. And it's a seven-year-old way. And it's, it is very hurtful when they say, I hate you, but that's not, you know, I hate my life. That that doesn't, it doesn't, that's not what they mean. It's just, they're saying this, I feel so terrible on the inside. And so don't take that as like, you know, literal that she hates her life. Okay. You have to take okay. this thing out of that. The next I've thing is try. Thank if you. people, yeah. If people are hurt by her, if she's saying that to other people, I, you do need to take her out of the situation and accompany her to a different room. You might want to tell the guests that are coming over that she's having regulation issues. You can't control that. And so if you're feeling really um, uncomfortable and ashamed about it, you actually need to talk about it with your friends or people or family or coming over and just let that out. Like just say what's going on and say you're trying to work on it and reading books or working with a therapist or, and that when you go into, you know, you need to tell her in the, um, before the few, the friends come over, when this happens, it means that you're um, feeling like your, your body is feeling stressed and it's not your fault. You're not doing it on purpose, but we're going to move to a different room. And in the room, I'm going to give you something to drink and I'm going to read you a story or we're going to look out the window, like tell her what's going to happen. And then you do it. Um, and you're not going to kick and, you know, I'm not going to hurt you and I'm not going to let you hurt me. And then we'll reset I'm not mad at you. And then we're going to, um, and then you're, we're going to go back downstairs. Um, it doesn't help to say, it's not nice to call people um, to say, I hate you to people. She knows that full well. And so it's not an issue of her being moral or polite beyond that. Like, unless it's, you know, a phase, I don't know if something happened to her or you might need to check in with the therapist about the regulation issues. So, yeah. Um, you mentioned, a book would you have a good resource as far as a book on this regulation issues that you can send me in that direction um i really like um raising the challenging child by karen buckwalter um and and then from the sensory perspective i there's a book called the out of sync child the what the out of sync child by Kranowitz. Yeah. Thanks, Mary. 
Um, Mary has written it in the chat in that way. Um, yeah, those are two books that you would definitely want to look into and they're, they're going to help you a lot. Um, there Thank is also you. a book called parent. There's actually a book called parenting with Thera play too. That's yeah. A good is, one. It, uh, is it, uh, yeah, I, should, I want to look, is it T H E R? Yeah. T H E R A P L A Y parenting with Thera play. Yep. There's Mary. All right, friends. Um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for your excellent um, contribu- contributions. Um, the people who asked your questions and were willing to be vulnerable and, and, and learn, help us all learn. Yeah. Thank you to all of our viewers. TRF offers free community programs like this one for you. Thanks to our volunteers, your questions and vulnerability really enrich the program and a Big thank you to Daphna for sharing your important and super valuable work. We're so grateful. We look forward to seeing you all at session two. You'll find the full schedule on the TRF website. Please share it with anyone you think could benefit. And recordings are available when you log into your TRF account. Until next time, take good care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. everyone.